Welcome back to Captains of Industry. Still with me in studio, Nicolas Kruger, the Group CEO of MMI Holdings. Let's look at your ranking within the insurance financial services industry. You've got Old Mutual clearly as the, the leader. Sanlam follows suit. And now with the merger, you are firmly in third place. Mm. Are you aspiring to number one position? Yes, uh, maybe just to give some numbers to put in perspective, our, our group embedded value is uh, 33 billion rands uh, at, at this stage, and our total assets under management at an administration 480 billion rands. So clearly we do have scale and so forth. Now I think the first maybe point to make is we don't chase size for the sake of size. You know, to be big you know, is not an objective in itself. You know, it's great to have scale, but for us it's much more important in our various divisions, are we client-centric, are we meeting the needs of clients, and are we doing that well? And when we do that well, the good shareholder returns will follow. So clearly we need to provide the returns to shareholders over time. But, but for, for, for me, those two are the, are the most important focus areas. And, and if we become number three or number four, so be it. Yeah. You've said that Africa is a big opportunity. Is it the biggest opportunity within the fold? I, is it fair to say that we're saturated where you play in South Africa? Yeah, I think it's interesting in South Africa, clearly we have scale and we've got some businesses where we've got very big market shares. I mean, to give you an example, our healthcare business, uh, we've got a market share of more than 30%. We cover more than 3 million lives in, in healthcare. On employee benefits, we've got a, a market share in South Africa of 25%. So clearly we want to maintain those market shares, but we have to look at areas where we're boxing below our weight. Now, uh, clearly short-term insurance being one of them, where we've got a market share of less than a percent. So there we're starting to enter much more. But from a geographical diversification perspective, Africa is by far the biggest focus area. You know, for us to, at this stage, still small, but we want that to be, say, between 10 and 15% of group profits over time and group profits will grow all the time so the target will will increase all the time maybe beyond Africa um, uh, we're looking at other markets like India we've got two people looking at opportunities for us there I mean that's also a market with more than a billion people so between Africa and India is more than two you, billion you're people. You're going to piggyback on the first round infrastructure into India. Yeah, we still have, yes we still have a very close relationship with first round obviously given the history of, of momentum and in fact our two people in India do sit in the first round offices in Mumbai and that's really helping us with next networks and connections. Yeah. If you look at the direct insurance or short term insurance, is that where the direct model is applicable, do you think, as you want to grow that as a, a piece of the business? Do you think it's about going direct for short term insurance or is there another trick of the trade? Yeah, look, uh, we sort of more, I guess, uh, experts with intermediate distribution, so that will be the first uh, objective. And we, I mean, we have a business momentum short term insurance uh, with a market share of about a half a percent or so. And look, there's a fantastic opportunity if you look at the MMI client base. If you just look at the main clients and ignoring beneficiaries, we've got 7 million clients in the group. We've got more than a million clients. So mine your existing clients. Really sell your products to your existing clients. It's a fantastic opportunity and uh, initially primarily through intermediaries, but over time we don't restrict ourselves. You know. How are you feeling about the, the temperature in South Africa at the moment? Obviously, we've seen widespread strikes. There's mm. the contagion across the mining industry and into other sectors. I've chatted to a number of captains of industry um, recently, Rian Stassen, mm. saying that you know, he doesn't feel that the country is going to come to a standstill, but there is always that possibility. Mm. How are you feeling? Yeah, look, we we obviously concerned about what's happening in the mining industry. Fortunately for us, the knock-on implications on our business are limited. It's just to the extent that we do have mining clients, but in the in the bigger scheme, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, ma a material impact. What obviously is of concern if it starts to spill over in the economy and start impacting the economic growth rates and so forth. Um, I think we we still very positive about the prospects of South Africa, you know, um, but our future is aligned to the economic growth rates. You know, so, uh, you know, I think growth might well be a little bit lower. And from that point of view, there's a lot of defensive strategies. One of our defensive strategies is to become more and more cost effective as we, as, as, as we continue, just to make sure that we can weather these storms. And through a very nice diversified portfolio of businesses that we've now got, we're actually very resilient against economic uh, uncertainty. Because there is the risk, yeah. obviously, that if consumers are under more and more yes. pressure, insurance generally being yes. that grudge purchase, that would yes. be one of the first areas that they would cut. Uh, absolutely. We compete for share of wallet with, with many, many other uh, players. But, you know, many clients are surprisingly loyal. You know, if you're even at the low end of the market with funeral policies, many of them just continue to pay those premiums because it's critical for them to have that benefit and a decent funeral. As an example now, uh, many, many clients with life cover, 
continue to keep that intact. The one area where clients often scale down first is discretionary savings. If they put some extra savings away, not the retirement savings, then if they go through a difficult patch, then they scale down there, which is not good in the long term, but, but so it does affect us. You know, also not a, a direct impact mm. on your business, but the debate raging around the unsecured lending bubble, yes. whether that is a reality in South Africa. Yes. Again, Rian Stassen firmly from Capitec, I spoke to him yes. yesterday, which yes. is why obviously I'm uh, quoting him, yes. saying that he doesn't believe that there is an unsecured lending bubble. Uh, he hasn't seen any flags to that effect. Yeah. What, what are you, your thoughts yeah, look, on that we, uh, uh, we actually, uh, as you said, we're not a participant at this stage. We are actually watching that, uh, those developments carefully. I think it's Because it could have a knock-on effect. It could have a knock-on effect. And, uh, and as I say, we compete for share of wallet. You know, so, and, and, and it's fair to say some clients are overextended. Whether or not it's a bubble, I think it's too early to say. You know, but um, personally, I think the growth rates in unsecured lending will really level, level off as the economy becomes more under pressure. And we have to see how that develops. Yeah. Let's get some insight into your leadership style. This is the softer issue <laughs> of our discussion. How mm. would you define yourself as a leader? Yes, I think I would be a situational leader. Uh, you know, what that means is you almost adapt your style depending on the circumstances. You know, but I'm also I'm a, very, uh, I'm a team guy. Very, very participative. You know, Have so you I've always been a team guy? Yes, I've almost grown up you know, in a business where it's always been a team effort. So it's not about me, about the, taking the credit personally. It's about the team and what the team can do jointly. And, and what we've achieved in MMI is really, we need, we need to give credit to the to MMI executive team. You know? There's the adage, of course, that a good leader surrounds himself with people that are potentially better than him yes. in certain disciplines. Yes. Have you done that? Absolutely. If, I mean, we've got seven divisions. Now, if I look at those divisional CEOs, many of them, if not all of them, actually do a better job to manage that specific area than what I could. You know, but, but my role is to create the right culture, the right environment. You know, we focus a lot on entrepreneurial culture with a focus on innovation, but also a performance-based culture and environment where people thrive. But my role is also to get people to cooperate. Where I see some silo thinking, I, I, I try to put the MMI hat on. You know, the, you know, that we do things in the interests of the whole. And it's been a fantastic journey this far. Is there an yeah. overriding trait that you look for in someone? If I was interviewing for a job, yes. what would be the, the factor that uh, yeah, I think gives the, me hope? There are a couple of hygiene factors. Clearly, sort of we, we are a values-based organization. So, I mean, the, you know, so we need to check whether the values of the individual, whether that's aligned to the company values. You know, the integrity, innovation, teamwork, accountability, those, those ones. Once that's a given, it's really um, whether the person will help us foster this, the right culture. It's almost a can-do performance-based uh, environment. You know, we, it's not a selfish environment. And uh, so we, 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 we're looking for people that can fit in and complement this environment. The yeah. other end of the spectrum, what won't you tolerate? Yeah, I, I mean, what's totally unacceptable uh, is, a, is a lack of values. You know, if, if there's questions about integrity, I mean, uh, or judgment, uh, you know, that's, that's unacceptable. Because when we bring in leaders, they really need to be an example. They need to set an example. I mean, we last week had a leadership conference where we took the top 150 people in the group. And we talked about values and innovation and teamwork and things like that. And really, the, the, the challenge for that top 1% of the organization is to rally the other 99% of the organization behind them to really take us to the next level. Now that you are no longer in the first round fold, uh, from a momentum perspective, innovation, you mentioned it just a moment ago, yes. is obviously a key tenant Absolutely. of the first round culture. Yes. Has that carried through in the merger? Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on innovation. We discussed it a lot at our conference. We had an external speaker on innovation, actually. It's one of our six values, and we've got four strategic pillars, and it's one of the strategic pillars as well. So it's absolutely critical. Um, I think it's still a journey to, you know, to be able to claim that you're overall a very innovative company, because obviously we're putting new things together and, and so forth, but it's, it's a key ingredient of meeting the needs of clients going forward. I said we were going into the softer part of, of the interview, and mm. viewers often want to know what is behind the mm. man <laughs> who is the captain of industry. So what don't people know about you, something from your, your personal life? 
Ja, uh, look, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a strong family man. You know, I've, uh, I've got a wife and three uh, teenage children, you know, two boys and, and, and a girl. And to me, that's very important. You know, when I get very busy, the support system there and so forth, and to spend quality time with them. Do you get the balance right? Because this is, again, yeah. another heated discussion point with many of the leaders that have had in that hot seat. Yeah, look, I, I guess the reality is it's very challenging to be a leader of a big organization from a time point of view. So it's really about spending quality time with your family. So we try to go away or do, th do things together over weekends and, and so forth. We, I mean, maybe as an, an interesting uh, hobby that we have, we, we uh, like spending time uh, at, at our Karoo farm. You know, we, we've got some scarce game there, you know, like buffalo and sable and all of that. And like taking the family there and really to enjoy nature because it's just so different from the, the corporate world. Mm -hmm. Do you switch off your phone on the, uh, on the weekends or is that not possible being the leader that you are? Yeah, it's not really possible, you know, I sort of, I'd, I'd like to take my phone with me and, you know, to be at least accessible. And what I really find is that people do respect your privacy. But there are situations where you have to be contactable, you know, and then, then I'm, uh, I'm open to that. Going back to your work day, what does your diary look like when you arrive at work on a Monday morning, your, your weekly diary, is it saturated? Yes. Or would I be able to get an appointment if I phoned in now to, to set up on Tuesday? Yeah, look, you're a very important person, so we'll, we'll, we'll make time for you in the diary. But, no, look, often I arrive at the office and it's back-to-back -back meetings the whole day. You know, and it, what's interesting, my, my youngest son is 11, he, he asked me, what, Dad, what do you do? And I said, no, I've got these meetings. And it's quite difficult to explain to them, what do you do in all these meetings? You know, but um, we try to make them as constructive as possible. And clearly, we, we, we open to reprioritize things, you know, and to move things around. And, and I really want to be accessible, even though I'm busy. If some of the leaders have issues, you know, they shouldn't have to wait two days, you know, are we you make time, you know. When you talk yeah. about those meetings, are they predominantly internal meetings or do you set aside time for external facing meetings? I mean, obviously, yeah. you've got to get the balance right. Yes, you have to get the balance right. And I think we've moved through an interesting phase of obviously in the early stage of the integration. It's a lot of internal issues to get the internal building blocks right. But we now refocusing the business, almost repositioning from integration to growth. You know, what's beyond the integration? Now, clearly with that, you have to focus a lot more on external uh, interaction, stakeholder management, the broader society out there, because we are a responsible corporate citizen too. It's not all about internal management. What do you want your legacy to be? Look, I really want to see uh, MMI live up to its potential in terms of the merger potential. And I really want to vest the right values in the organization, really in this entrepreneurial culture, uh, uh, innovative culture and, and high performance culture and really see, see us achieve our potential. We've already made a lot of progress. But I still see some, uh, some uh, further uh, challenges ahead. Nicholas, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's edition of Captains of Industry. Until next time, from myself, Bernard Nielsen, it's goodbye.